please join me in welcoming John Torres. Yes. Um, good evening. I'm John. This is Aki. Uh, you're going to see her later as well. Um, thank you to the Michael Foundation. Thank you to Los Angeles Book Forum for making this possible. This is a diary of our times from 2017 to 2020, meaning the Duterte um, pandemic times all the way to the Marcos Jr. time in the Philippines. Um, that is also the time when I became a father and I had to kind of find ways to be more practical about being as continue, continuing on as an artist filmmaker and also being present as a father, um, my daughter. Um, and so you will see three parts. The first part, is a result of my visits to film sets in the Philippines only because I wanted to spend only three hours in a day to be away from home so that I could be with my family. And so I would visit those sets and without any conception of what's going to happen to tap into the other filmmaker sets and to document what is going on. As I, as I document, I see things, I see recorded images, and in fact, really a, a window into the times as well from our own storytellers reacting to the Duterte um, violent war on drugs. Um, it's also um, for me preparing myself to find a language that would be um, for as an explanation of the times, also a gentle explanation of the times to her daughter. The second one is really a. <laughs> Uh, diary in a sense that I source Zoom calls, student um, projects because I'm a teacher in the Philippines and also there's stock footage because um, all born uh, um, out of my goodbye to my friends in a car ride that I recorded through sound. It was a 40 minute or no, 20 minute car ride. Most of it waiting for my friends to come, but also in the car in the context of walking. And I remember during a rainy day in a car, um, saying goodbye to the Philippines and feeling good about it. Um, also fl flying in and out of spaces, as I also grieved for, my, for the passing of my mother, whom we lost uh, at the first wave of the pandemic in the Philippines. The last one is. Um, a morphing of the first project that I conceived out of my visit to film sets, now a fictional restaging of out of the same premise. It is a half film because I just uh, took advantage of just some resources that were available, uh, uh, another commission to make a film that we could not possibly finish, but we just wanted to start and shoot and edit. So it's a half film. There will be no credits after that, so, uh, <laughs> so you might be uh, surprised a little bit. Anyway, um, let's just talk later. Thank you for coming. Um, it's an honor to be here. Generous grant from the Mike Kelly Foundation. Um, we're brainstorming artists that we really wanted to bring. Uh, John Torres was one of the first names I suggested because it, it struck me that he had such an interesting body of work already and I was really excited at the prospect that we could do something to support uh, further work on his part and then also maybe a little selfishly that we get to then have him in LA to do a couple of shows. So um, this has been an amazing uh, pair of programs. I hope some of you were also at the other one uh, two nights ago at Whammy. Uh, but to talk a little bit further about what you've just seen. I'd like to introduce John Torrance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for suggesting my name and uh, having this opportunity to do work. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was really amazing to see these three together because I felt like within the films, I was experiencing almost this sense of 
deja vu, but then across the three films, there's like really this like uh, exponential experience of deja vu that was really, really interesting. But I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about the relationship between the pieces. Do you envision them as always showing together or in relationship with each other? Yeah. Um, okay, first, the first film, as I said, I guess I got one year of training in, in, in isolation, <laughs> in containment, uh, just by being a father, a young father, and I wanted to redo my best to uh, balance the two, to making it very good. Uh, and so I felt like wanting to be at home, but also continuing the work as an artist. So yeah, I, I devised like this set of rules when I visit sets to kind of shoot the spaces and also try to make a story for my daughter. So the way I framed everything, I wouldn't um, include like stands, the, the things behind the making, just to have this story that can be continuous. So I didn't have any story, but I was also getting so much material. Um, and I knew I, I also had time to digest and things, think things through. I'm an editor, so uh, I'm all about sometimes pace, unfolding, rhythm, and I've long ago um, surrendered the idea of continuity as something that is one and even um, continuity as something that we can go from space to space and from time to time. So when the pandemic came um, and we had our loss in the family, I was all be beginning to see how can I make the film then. Um, I was able to make the short film that you saw first, and I really wanted to um, expand it into a feature, and that's why it opened with um, a pitch uh, that I actually gave at the market uh, for them to see my own continuance of the, the story that I wanted to expand on. And then I came and I knew that no one will shoot again, so how would I do it? Um, and then I got a, the commission. And so I was just thinking about more about the spaces. And the spaces that I was traveling uh, into was the uh, space of the classroom um, with people, uh, being with people. Um, it almost kind of uh, felt like it was a ritual, I guess, a morning as well. Um, to see other people, aside from my, my family, um, to talk to other people about other things, but also keeping to heart uh, what we really want to tell each other. And um, the experience of loss has, uh, was immense um, within um, the Zoom space. And so when we were, so what you saw were three um, exercises, I guess. Um, having to unify space, having to, um, through sound, activate the camera, through the Zoom function, um, having to imagine that we're still possible, to, possibly together. Um, and voice was something that continued and made it possible for us to tell stories, um, traveling to and from, um, and other resources of footage as well. Um, so that, and then we had to leave. So we had to leave. I didn't know what to do except to have a diary of the, of the times. I knew that I wanted to share this uh, with a support to the Sanders Film Forum and uh, the Mike Kelly Foundation. And so aside from the Zoom sessions, I also documented my, my daughter because it was practical for me to, to just turn on the Zoom session and I recorded you know, um, session and just see my daughter and how, what what you really felt about the times, even though we don't really talk about it. Um, so when we had to leave, I just thought of just recording because voice, sound, um, has a lot of possibilities. And even if we close our eyes, even if we don't see anything on screen, we can imagine things further um, and we can travel along. Um, so I recorded my goodbye just um, from the car, from the, from the gate. Um, during a rainy night, um, to say goodbye to other two, two friends. And that's basically what I had coming to Berlin, where we had to spend nine months, uh, six months there for my wife's uh, residency. So 
I never had time to digest everything. Um, it was all about my friends. It was all about um, our minds um, looking at the skies and seeing, looking for signs whether Mark was will be doing the same things, whether whether we we're expecting the same things again. Um, and it was a goodbye that was joyful for me because a good riddance, I don't want to be there anymore. Um, but finally, I had to edit things using sound. Um, I knew that I wanted to, to include student uh, works because they freely expressed themselves at that time. It was special. Same time, I, I knew I had to kind of see my friends or sense my friends through image. And so I, I just thought of using stock footage to kind of have this relationship between image and sound. First, very diegetically and trying to be continuous. But at the same time, I also wanted to have kind of this distance and a synchronous relationship to, to image so that we know that we're really developing this kind of tone of a tree of something that we can all meet in. At the same time, I know that my daughter will also um, hear about this kind of process of other people. And I know that she will see this. I want it to be consistent from the first to, to the second. This tone still continues, uh, this rhythm not unfolding. And it was very, very intuitive, very, very thankful again for this process because I wasn't at all rushed by, by anyone. Like Adam, Adam was always in touch with me from the Los Angeles Food Forum, never asked me to rush to things. And um, very thankful for that. And so with stock footage, I wanted to see, okay, these are strangers, these are image, images scaled for the consumer market. And I, I think there is still some emotion contained there. I wanted to extract those things. Um, if I want, if I can do a combination of montage and continuity and um, a different sense of um, collage between them that we can all accept now as coming from other spaces. So this um, distance between sound and image was very interesting for me to, uh, to evoke. Uh, at the same time, the impact of a body in a car um, very personally, of course, oh, it, it, it's, it's rooted very personally because that was the, the impact of a body that was loaded onto a vehicle to be wheeled, wheeled away. Um, that, was, that was also the impact of the news during the 100, year, 100 days of, first 100 days of Marcos. When the CCTV footage, we, we don't see the body. It impacts the vehicle. And this is the same space that I have with friends to say goodbye, to say hello, to fetch friends, and to go somewhere else. Um, the way all, um, in the middle, um, our daughter was into that, saw me editing things, and that's why you hear her voice just really. Um, when, when I was subtitling things, and when I was um, doing things with sound, um, and I freely integrated that. Into process um, and to the experience. Um, last part was still about voices, but at the time when we were really talking about AI <laughs> so much, but I knew there were tools, uh, the avatars, the simple um, things that we could do so that we can um, change totally our voices. At the same time, as we change the process and over and over again, things are lost in terms of pronunciation, syllables, and so I was thinking a lot about a year, a year and a half ago, I went to the first film festival that I, that I was able to go to since the pandemic began. It was an experimental film festival. And inevitably there were a lot of, I guess if it's now a genre, like pandemic films. <laughs> um, and I was really, I was disappointed in how mediocre a lot of them seemed to me. And I was so uh, excited, especially with the middle piece here, to find the first 
a brilliant pandemic film. I feel like I've seen finally. And but this idea of how you capture, as you said, you're. I mean, I think you're an amazing editor in the way that you're integrating all of this kind of material. And it nevertheless feels, um, I mean, it feels personal, but also feels distant. It feels, um, there's a great sense of curiosity and confusion mm -hmm. that you're kind of sharing with us because we're having the same feelings watching it, I think. Wow. But I, I love that you captured the sort of discordant aspect of life, especially during the first year and during a quarantine period that a lot of us, uh, I think, didn't quite know what to do with ourselves. And, but also a sort of dreamlike haze uh, I, I mean, I, I have trouble remembering the specificity of that time period, and yes. I feel like this film really captures that beautifully. And it, it seems like something like that could only come in a very intuitive way, like finding it as you were making it. And so that's a very long introduction to a, a question, which is for the middle piece, how much of that would, uh, was there a preconception of what the final form would be, and how much of it did you really completely discover in the making? No, the amazing thing is I've been so at home with just being led by nothing, you know, that like like something that is as simple as just a beat or a pause. And that you can you can just hear or just look within the frame and see. And I've I've been doing it for for much of the films that I've been making. And so right like this was kind of like a step into further into the process and, and discovering so much so much more. Um, before it was led by uh, one voiceover narration that that I stripped that off, but documentation of intimate people, it would friends, family, and then I stripped that off into strangers and and having sort of still the same space that we inhabit and and to discover things remain, um, that things can still translate into something. I really don't know what I, I what I was doing, Mark, um, for much of the time, but just to, to <laughs> move. Three, just move. Well, that and, didn't worry you either, I feel. Right? I don't know, maybe it sounds arrogant, but it, I, I just felt a sense of peace to be kind of um, a lot of things outside my control so that I could just react to the strongest things and just choose immediately and have that faith to just know that there should be something here because I, I know it. Um, and so this is not at all draft two, draft three, draft four, no major revisions. This is just really the, 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 the rhythm, the, the, the order that I felt strongly about. Yeah. So, so the question about the 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 three pieces, if if I see that or plan that ahead, no, but not at all. But it seemed like it's much much. Uh, there's a much better um, flow when seen together. Um, and fortunately, Adam was really very supportive. About that. Yeah. I I really love seeing them together. Yeah. And I couldn't help but wonder also with the third piece, because yes. you described it as a work in progress, yeah. but could you say a little bit more about what you envision yeah, so, for its completion? So it's, it's a more thing of my project as a filmmaker as well, trying to just make things practical. I'm not at all with, uh, in the center of mainstream or narrative filmmaking. No one supports me, especially in my mid-career already. Um, so I, I know that the, what's this? So I just, um, yeah, I, I know that through it all, um, I'm guided by him, he said, um, that it's still the courage of, of making the films. Um, even though I know that the, no one will really volunteer to help. But being a teacher, um, I'm able to tell things to other, to other people and check if I really believe this is true. And so far, so good.
the questions at all? Because I have plenty more, but should have just talked for Mark, so I think I've lost it to my thoughts. That's okay. <laughs> so, Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> really enjoyed the showing, but I have a quick question. You know, it felt like there was a through line of the cyber occult as like a theme without you within your movie. And I was wondering if you could talk about how that particular theme marries with your sense of time or being outside of time in the image and how maybe sound either brings in cadence or rhythm or it takes it away. Yeah, sound really was something that flew that would be possible. I really can't believe that we're here because we were in, in a strip laptop for two years and there was no end in sight. It felt like it. You know, um, in other countries, uh, they, were, they were having school as usual. We were just really separated and just to hear the passing vehicles. I was so jealous about being sound. You know, um, and sound if we come to think of it, it's really evoking so much, even more than if we hear it and see it. So I would, I, I really, I really, I really let that um, lead me through the process of editing. Um, yeah. Especially the voice, uh, the voice of, voice of, of someone you long to hear again. Um, there's no more chance to have a perfectly synced diegetic image and sound of this person already, um, even if you recreate. Um, but there is, yeah. Uh, so I, I kind of let go of that possibility. Uh, John, can you talk a little bit more about um, the way that you work with your students and how that work with your students ends up as part of these films? Oh, wow, I took advantage of, of um, these <laughs> courses because I said, okay, we'll just call it lockdown filmmaking and then we'll just explore every session, what we can do and what what do we have. We don't have cameras, we just have Zoom. And, uh, and we, we could just make use of virtual backgrounds and and um, see how we, it feels like we're together. But a lot of the students were still very much into like what's realistic, what's um, very convincing, what's high res. Uh, so we, we really had to talk things through in terms of that. And for me, to selfishly, I, I was I was really heavily invested in what can, what we can do, especially at that time because I really felt like um, we couldn't do anything. Um, so which reminds me that um, we when 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 you invited me now um, to have this kind of project in your class. I had so much fun to also do it <laughs> um, in, in, in your class as well. Um, and I learned so much. I was prepared to just give it all up and just have Zoom to just make films at this time. And yes, 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 okay, okay. Ah, maybe I did. Ah, maybe that is a question. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the first one was a fictional version, hybrid fictional of a pamphlet story on a visited sense. From there, I got the premise of, because of the recurring images that I got from filmmakers to their films at this time, strong images of the military, of police, and citizen really just having to surrender their bodies. I thought of a premise that would have that uh, tone into the first one. So, okay, now that I knew that I could do it this way, I just thought maybe make a fictional um, story really out of it, not having to visit sets anymore. Because at that time, later on, I think it was pretty evident that things were opening up. And so we, wrote a script, I got a commission from Singapore to make a film and live performance. And I told them, okay, I'm gonna make a film. <laughs> um, let's do the performance in Singapore to continue, but I will expand on this 
This was a version of the first in the border, where in, um, we wrote the story with the same premise, not fictional. So, yes, the footage was shot last year with friends, um, which is minimal budget for us. And hopefully that's also a pitch for us to, <laughs> to have other people just come you, on. You directed that girl. So, yes, I, I also direct, directed that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, different approaches. As I, as I want, I had to. I think that was also a. I had to be practical. So if I were to continue making the story, and kind of shift a little bit in terms of approach and the process of the creative work, that was the end. So it is now a fictional kind of story, still personal. Same tone. So, in the end, I'm uh, really am glad that it goes into another in a kind of a tone that. That looks yes. Are you talking more about the Middle East or the Middle East? But even the last piece of story. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, when, well, when we speak in, in the Philippines, most of us, we shut them from natives of Filipino and sometimes mix a lot. Um, and it's, it's kind of our way to just be more personal, actually. Um, none of us are really very, very good at speaking. Street, street, Filipino. Um, other than formal situations when you are forced to, um, and it seems proper. Uh, but every day, 40 years of American rule, <laughs> like, um, we shift from English to Filipino. Um, what else? In what, did you did you notice anything about language? Sorry, I'm also <laughs> he's he's a writer, he's a he's a and a, a, a very good one at that. Well, you know, I think it's it's not I'm glad to know that. The, the color uh, dialogue, though, was from the student works. Uh, so it was, it was, uh, so the student work was the one with that color dialogue, and also, of course, the Zoom session, and also um, the virtual background. Uh, can you help me or something? Um, I wanted to ask about uh, 
this, you know how you were talking about is there, these are just the way that it felt like possible to make films. Um, and also that you were thinking about why I wanted to speak to my daughter with this. So I guess my question is when you're making your work, do you have in mind like people or like an audience and how much does that affect people? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And I just kind of mentioned that because you know, not everyone's able to like, My students have to be able to do this. My daughter should be able to like hear this song when they're making their work. Yeah. And I'm brainwashing my daughter to oh, this, this is how films are really. <laughs> <laughs> this is cinema. Uh, um, yeah, I, I can't think beyond uh, really special people, actually, in terms of an audience. Um, I have long abandoned kind of like. And of course, I would love to have more people. I guess that's also an interesting um, point, actually, on translating things and having having to know that oh, I think I have the these things, the core things, the, the pulse, the, the sensibility that can translate to a bigger audience. So that's why for this, uh, the last one, I I worked with actually actors, mainstream actors here, which I haven't. And so that is an ongoing discussion. No? Um, as, as an artist, you try to push things more and just see how you respond to it. Um. I love how your approach to editing in all three pieces, I was thinking, especially the middle one, really captures, you know, the, the, the sort of myth of linearity and narrative. It, I mean, it's something that's been taught to us by theater, by literature, by cinema and all that. Yeah. And there's a value and there's an interest in that. But I, I love how you're trying to access more of the domain of subjective thought and association of things and a little bit of repetition and, uh, you know, almost foretelling things that are coming later. And I mean, it seems like a much more, um, organically connected to how we think and how we embody all these things in our heads at the same time and we're trying to reconcile them. And that's actually a very natural process for us, but in, in film, we're used to it proceeding in a more or less linear yeah. way. But I feel like you're really um, exploring that in a really um, complex way. Yeah, um, the, my, my consciousness. Yeah. My first love was um, music and which made, made me feel the most space and, and improvisation and, and all all things that you could go from one to another, which is not necessarily linear, it's all going from one place, you know, um, and even putting to sleep, and with music that you're not taught, and you just take time to just find the right combination of notes, it puts you to sleep while playing it. Yeah, that's, 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 that's amazing, right? So that is aspiration. Um, and so I wasn't really um, thinking about any idea, you know. Um, even if I, I almost, almost all, always um, face to the timeline. Yeah. <laughs> there are layers, <laughs> layers of editing. So I know, okay, this special shot goes here. <laughs> and then color coded. And color coded, <laughs> right? And, yes, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and sometimes they overlap, and they um, and it's, it's still linear. Um, you never get to see those hidden things, and you get to question: Hey, does it still feel right? You know, so in terms of editing, you're still building layers, but same time thinking things through linearly, also, and saying, Ah, oh, it's possible. No, it's an interesting uh, thing because we're still experiencing it as. As the piece passing, and yes, time. you know we're, we're experiencing it in, in real time, and yeah, it's it, yeah, it, it's yeah. a really interesting conflict. So, in fact, the last piece, I wanted to have that straight line because um, I wanted the digital footage to have kind of a a place that you can unroll. So everything that you saw was shot digitally, but also put into kind of this moving uh, roll film. So 16 millimeter and then come back to the digital. So I really wanted to, yeah. I don't know I, what, why I really wanted to do it. It cost so much, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of trying. I just, 
I just have food <laughs> spent on it. <laughs> it takes it a little bit out of time, too. Yes, yes. For a little bit, it almost feels like, is this a film from the 80s, the 90s, mm -hmm. or, so, or even earlier? And yes. Mm -hmm. it, I, yeah. I just wanted to know that somewhere in Australia, I can unroll it and the, and the images just flow one to the other. <laughs> and it's just there. <laughs> Well, when we're thinking of history repeating itself, when you're thinking politically in the film, some of the things you're talking about are <laughs> It like ends up having this other meaning, like the material itself has this meaning suggesting, is this history? Is this the present? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm really looking forward to having the screaming in the Philippines. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really thrilled we could have the screening here. I don't know if anybody has any other questions, but... Um, I don't know. I want to thank you so much um, for being here, for sharing uh, these two programs of work, and I want to thank you all for coming. This is a really wonderful uh, audience. This is the thank you. Thank you.